Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 28th, 2024. Our readings are first is from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. Our alternative first reading is from 2 Samuel, continuing in chapter 11, reading verses 1 through 15. Our psalm is 145, reading verses 10 through 18. And uh, uh, the uh, second reading is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. With our gospel reading, as we told you last week, uh, where we would interrupt uh, uh, our reading from uh, Mark to run into John. And we're going to pick up in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21, which means we're going to have a large crowd about to have lunch. Yes, we interrupt this regularly scheduled programming for five weeks in John 6, the Bread of Life Discourse. Yes. And I know, because I see it all over Facebook, how excited preachers are to preach the Bread of Life Discourse. Not. But. Are they not? Much, no. Why are they not? Because they think, I think, they think Jesus is repeating himself. What else can you say about bread, right? And mm -hmm. uh, how can I preach on bread for five weeks in a row? And, uh, but the, the trick <laughs> for really any of the discourses, but particularly this one, is to, you really need to look ahead to the end of the discourse uh, and what what is then said, uh, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. If you're, you know, doing a gospel acclamation and you don't have to do the alleluia, but that's, that's the whole, that's where the whole discourse is going. Who else can we go to? God, uh, Jesus is offering, uh, his very self and in this discourse and each portion of the discourse is another unique revelation as to what that means. Mm -hmm. So if you th can think about it that way, that each section is going to reveal yet one more thing about what it means to, uh, to know, Lord, who else can we go? To whom else can we go? Uh, and that each, each, actually each section says something new, believe it or not, if you can trust that, your your movement through the bread of life will be, uh, I think, um, it, it will be really powerful. And uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, and I, of course, you know, I have a lot to say, but. Um, if you're right, Caroline, um, and, and, and I, I lean in to agree with you, um, one of the ways that our preaching becomes more exciting is when we learn something new. And so um, then we, we communicate that excitement just in our very being to our listeners. Right. Um, so one of the things to think about is um, I, I think the word is etymology of the word bread. And um, so um, the bread is the substance of life. Then it's the very basic of uh, um, uh, food, uh, uh, and in that basic food, um, from um, European um, understandings of the bread, um, um, that's if I'm remembering this correctly, that's where the idea of Lord comes from, and uh, this idea of uh, not in terms of the kingly understanding that we think of in terms of Lord, but actually who is it that is the provider of this substance of food? And so the bread uh, provider is the Lord and that uh, paying attention to that, paying attention to how that word is used, um, not in ancient times, but used in Europe. Uh, and then um, there, there, there's a linguistic 
uh, in terms of what that means for the lady of the house, uh, what that means for the Lord of the house that has more to do with providing, which will take us to where you're pointing us, Caroline, then where do we go? Truly, Jesus is the provider. Truly, Jesus is Lord. And so paying attention to this new way of looking at just bread and connecting that not in the royal sense, that's the word I was looking for, not in the royal sense of Lord, um, but in the, the sense of what it means to who is the one that I can trust that will provide. Um, and that, that's another linguistic way to make this uh, um, a new learning for, you, for your listeners uh, as you get into the theological um, learnings. Yeah, I think the, um, I think preachers get themselves in trouble with this section of scripture if they look too far ahead too often. I mean, I think knowing the ending like you said, Caroline is obviously great, but then it's like, just stick to the text that you have today, mm -hmm. the text that you have assigned. When you're in like week three and four, you might, you'll look back a bit and help people see where you got there, but you don't want to like give away everything in the very first sermon and you don't no. want to no. do it again in the second sermon, but you need to know where it's going to end. So you have a sense of how this is moving somewhere because it doesn't repeat, but it does cycle back. Mm -hmm. almost like a helix, right? It's kind of closer to the center of the more times you go around the circle, right. um, mm -hmm. which makes it really interesting uh, to me. And so today you've got actually a pretty straightforward text, a pretty straightforward story, right? And I mean, you this is the basis of what's going to follow, but it's also, um, there's a lot in this to make for some really compelling preaching, I think. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, I, I say this every year, but I'll say it again and again and again and again, that that it, it the sign itself is... You sound like Jesus now. <laughs> the, but, you know, the sign itself is... Uh, it, it is not you know, it's not the issue. It's really what it, what is it revealing about, uh, about who Jesus is and mm -hmm. where Jesus comes from. And that's mm -hmm. the, that's the importance of looking ahead a little bit again. Yeah. You're right, Matt. Don't give it away. Just mm -hmm. give, just, just preach what you have here, but you, uh, you look at the differences in terms of the fact that Jesus himself feeds the 5,000. It's not distributed to the disciples to do that. There is language of abundance, which we get in all of the signs in the Gospel of John, and that these signs elicit a dialogue as to what they mean. And then Jesus provides an interpretation of it because signs can be misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. and, and, and primarily what Jesus wants out of this sign is to recognize that it's not the bread, it's Jesus is offering his very self and the entirety of himself. Um, nothing held back, absolutely nothing held back. And, and that Jesus is this ultimate provider and sustainer of life, abundant life. And so, uh, and I, you know, the other we can talk about the uh, the walking on the water in a minute, but because there's some elements there that are important, a whole nother train of thought, <laughs> a whole nother thing is to invite preachers to consider what difference it makes to think about Holy Communion and the Lord's Supper through the lens of John. Because there is no Lord's Supper in John. There is no, there's a Last Supper, but there's no Lord's Supper. And uh, this is really, you know, I, I, I don't want to get into a lot of the sacramentology of John, but this is really uh, the moment. But it's actually not the only moment. Jesus will host a meal again in 13. Jesus will host again a meal in, verse, in chapter 21. And so what difference does it make that Jesus as host of this communal meal, these communal meals, it, uh, that hosting is not is not necessarily connected to his death uh, and on the night in which he was betrayed, but is but is embedded in his life and his ministry. And so I think it invites 
uh, and a really wonderful opportunity for preachers to dive deep into John's sacramentology, if there is one, and and say, how does this how does this invite us to think about what Holy Communion means and what the Lord's Supper means in really profoundly different ways? Uh, and uh, but it's just not it's just not a stream of sacramentology that we talk about because we are so shaped by the synoptic and Pauline tradition. And I think it could open up a lot of really important communication for people, per- particularly post-pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe this is the first time we've had these, ta- well, no, we had them in 21, I guess, right? Yeah, 21. But but to, yeah, to get people to think about what does Holy Communion mean to them? What is What do they think about? So all kinds of possibilities here. Oh, it's going to be hard for me to stop talking. <laughs> you don't get excited about going? Ron at all. Well, I have a, I have a couple other things to say. But Joy yeah, and I are just, just Joy and I, I think are just both afraid to to get in the way. <laughs> yeah, it's like, can I say anything about John? No, no. Let, uh, let we'll let Caroline keep going. Oh, you go, go right ahead. I will say this, and and they'll they'll there there may be another something that I add, but but I I will say this, and that is uh, before we get to um, the um, walking on the water scene is the um, verse nine. There's a boy here. Uh, and uh, every once in a while, I think it's important for us to remember that while the count is often given of the men, there's a recognition that there are women and children in the midst. And um, what it means in our gatherings, in our ministry, in our planning, to pay attention to all the folks that are present, uh, including the children. And in this particular case, um, uh, can you imagine, you know, for all the years of the people who were there, a little boy still telling this story after all the old folks are gone. And this story remains alive because this kid says, yeah, I remember that day my mom made me pack a lunch. And this is what Jesus did with this um, it becomes it becomes a, a powerful way to um, to narrate the the power of narration, um, but also to pay attention to who is in the crowd and how the stories of Jesus are perpetuated. That's my insert. I'll just say I, I, I appreciated the accent on abundance, and you mentioned how that's in all of the signs, um, Caroline, and just to talk about the. Um, the abundance of of green grass, the abundance of the leftovers, yeah. uh, the twelve baskets, and that everybody eats uh, as much as they wanted and when they were satisfied, right. and yeah. that um, it's a remarkable thing for these people in this place at this time in that economy. You know that that's there's something just remarkable about that that shouldn't be. We can't make this just a story about a feeding or just a survival strategy for a day. There's something here that's obviously proclaiming something much larger, much grander. And that should start, I think, the place to begin then is with with wonder about that, that before we start trying to give answers again, that the sermon sits in that wonder and thinks about food, thinks about what happens around tables, thinks about things like scarcity and what that does to people and thinks about um, banqueting instead of gerund, uh, you know, thinks about those now. kinds of celebrations and what happens when food is shared and when it's freely available or widely available. Yeah. And well, as I'm done, I think we can move on to second Kings now. Okay. I have one more thing to say and we <laughs> de- we do need to move on, but because we have some other important texts, but the, I mean, I think that abundance is, uh, it, it, it's really key uh, in terms of the first sign of John two of the wedding at Cana, and that uh, you know the next the, that next meal that Jesus will host uh, in chapter twenty one, come and eat, where there's bread and fish, uh, is also abundant, right? And it's in that abundance, it's in the abundance that the disciples recognize that it's Jesus. 
And so, mm -hmm. um, so that's another, I think, homiletical thread. The, the thing I would say about the walking on the water, I, uh, it's, uh, when in verse 14, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world and they want to make him king. What the walking on the water scene does is centralize the main claim of this of this gospel, but also the main claim of of the bread of life discourse is that who who got where Jesus comes from and who Jesus is is the I am, mm -hmm. right? It, the translation it, it is I, but it's I am. Do not be afraid, <clears throat> and it's the second absolute I am in the Gospel of John. And so this is the pattern, right? The woman at the well sees Jesus as a prophet and then potentially the Messiah, the, uh, the man born blind, seeing Jesus as a prophet and then recognizes him as Lord. And so the prophet and King are very, very penultimate claims of who right. Jesus is. Right. Uh, it really is to get to and we'll see this as we move forward in the discourse of Jesus making the connection. Who gave you the bread from heaven? It was God. Hello, here I am. <laughs> so anyway, okay, moving right now along. That, oh, it's going to be a great week's preaching. That makes a great segue, mm -hmm. though. I refrained from jumping this in uh, when Matt was talking uh, uh, about looking uh, at um, – uh, this provision and, and seeing it as more um, to, uh, uh, I know what it was that you said, you were, you were talking about the wonder. Um, and what I wanted to do was to, to draw back to where is, where else has this abundance um, in this place for this people uh, been uniquely and wonderfully expressed. And that would be um, God providing for Israel as they travel through the wilderness, but also here as we read in Second Kings. And so once mm -hmm. once again, the wonder of being provided for, uh, how can I set this before a hundred people? Uh, give it to the people, let them eat, for they shall eat and have some left. This is not the first time, uh, this is the thread, this is not the first time that the I am has shown up and shown out among the people who are uh, being supplied with abundance. And that's also true for the psalm, right? So I would I would connect people to the, I, we don't have, I mean, I don't mean to get away from the second King tech right away, but that the language of the psalm fits so beautifully with the the John six passage, give you, uh, give them food and due season. Uh, it, you open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. Uh, and so that, that turning to the Lord to satisfy all of our needs, uh, and is really what's, what's, what's being said in the bread of life discourse. This is not, you know, <laughs> this is, this is, uh, and now, and now God is doing that through Jesus. I can just throw in at verse 13, your kingdom is an everlasting and the dominion endures throughout all generations. I, I'm just adding that in because I talked about that kid being able to tell the story for so many years. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were going to say something. Matt, I, I was just thinking that, you know, one thing you could make sure you do all five of these weeks is, is talk in some way about Old Testament traditions about a God yeah. who feeds. Yes. Yeah. And we're seeing that here. We'll certainly get that with with Exodus next week and right. and more down the road. That that this is uh, Jesus' disclosure of who He is is fully in line with the priorities of God we see in the Old Testament as well. Right. And I've mentioned this in the past. This week, you get to have your lay reader or whoever reads scripture say, "Baal Shalisha," <laughs> when you're doing Second Kings four, which is a lot of fun. Yes. 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 They will thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not right away. It will come. Yeah. They'll be thankful years down the road. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. We should go to uh second Samuel. Do we want to? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. This is I, really amazing. Uh, well, here's yeah. the thing. It's one of the best known stories of David alongside of the story with Goliath. It is. Yeah. And it's so it's got to be, you've got to do some unteaching 
Yes. For yeah. anybody who has um, romanticized it. Right. But you were going to say, Caroline, go ahead. No, I I think um, I the the commentary is very helpful and doesn't uh, and same with next week doesn't beat around the bush in terms of what this is mm-hmm. and and what David's uh, what David's true <laughs> act is mm-hmm. and uh, I uh, but Joy I'm I, I'm serious when you said you know do we have to you know if I were uh, uh, this is, you're absolutely right, Matt, in terms of how how do we speak into th- this reality of who David was and what he did to Bathsheba. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it also is a, um, how do I say this? If you as a preacher have experienced any kind of, um, or know of people in your congregation who have experienced sexual assault, even rape, uh, it is, um, this is going to, this is deeply, deeply troubling. And, um, and it, I think it's, a I think it's a moment of deeply intentional pastoral care. So, um, because we've talked about this before, that there are there texts that, uh, well, there's certainly texts that you simply cannot read out loud, and mm-hmm. uh, and um, and not preach on them. But I think with this text, and and if you're going to preach it for what it is, then as the preacher, you yourself <laughs> need to be um, ready for potentially uh, prepared for the uh, the emotions that it might raised for you personally, and then what could come up in the congregation. So, um, there, this is the, this has a, this has a before and an after that has, uh, that has far more repercussions, um, I think than, than, um, which I think our preachers know, but I'm just saying it. (laughs) No, no, I think it's important. And the deconstructing, um, Matt, as you said, this is, probably the most well-known, the second most well-known story. Um, And yet um, David needs to, this needs to be presented as as the uh, abuse of power that David is abusing, is using. And uh, there also needs to be, uh, as you've you've stated well, Caroline, the recognition of uh, what this is going to do in the imagination of a variety of people if we are honest with what is actually happening here. Um, but I want to add something that I, I had an, an experience with, and that is by presenting this honestly about who David was and uh, um, not glorifying David uh, in, a, in a macho sense, but calling him to accountability for, you know, why was he not where he was supposed to be and, and what he did because he was ignoring that. And then what he continued to do to try to to get away with it. I actually had um, uh, one man come to me in a congregation who was very troubled by the fact that David was no longer a hero. And for months after that sermon, continued to wrestle with that. And that was how he began to open his heart because it, it it had not occurred to him that he needed to rethink scripture. And even though he fought me along it, what he was doing week after week, month after month, was still wrestling with, if I read it this way, it, it, it makes an impact on me. And the other was uh, another situation where I had a man come and what he basically said was, you need to know I'm David. And thank you for that sermon, because I have to respond differently. Um, So um, while obviously I appreciate our recognition of how this will affect women, I think we need to also be aware um, that this will have an effect on men too. And um, I guess what I want to say is we should preach it with that in mind. That that mm-hmm. you know when 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 we are allowing the spirit to work through these words, we may think we're talking to one group, but our words by the power mm-hmm. of the spirit are being heard by 
others. So let's prayerfully be attentive to all. Yeah, and I think one thing that's you know that's um, implied in what both of you have said is, at some point in the sermon, you have to say, "So what?" <laughs> you have to say, "Why is this story here? Why did I choose to preach on this?" Yeah. Out of the other texts available to me, mm-hmm. and what are we going to say about this? Mm-hmm. Or where is God in this? Not to try to give it a, a pleasant mm-hmm. conclusion. That's not my point. Mm-hmm. But you have, if you're going to walk people through that mm-hmm. difficulty. There has to be a, this is a moment where it's kind of like, this is why it was valuable to do this here in this place in a worship service right here and right now. Mm -hmm. In a text that makes no mention of God and, right, you know what I mean? There's no, it's kind of like a, why is this story even in the Bible in the first place kind of a feeling. And, And I'm not sure the preacher has to answer that, but you have to, I think, acknowledge like, this is not what I come to the Bible looking for. No. No, I, you know, I, I think, I think, yeah, that's right, Matt. Um, and I, and I, I think my other caution too, I mean, I, I totally get what you're saying, Joy. My other, my other concern too, is that it turns into some kind of, um, maneuverings or judgment. I mean, definitely judgment of David and, and the commentary talks about this, but is this so what to give voice to Bathsheba? Um, to give voice to the Me Too's Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that are sitting in your pews and that you as a preacher might even have said Me Too. Um, And maybe maybe that's enough, that there's a Me Too story in the Bible (laughs) And, Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and you're not alone. I think if I would preach on this text, I would commit to it to the two texts and, and, and continue the story next week. Mm. Mm-hmm. And and I'll I'll say more about that when we do the podcast for that yeah. for the I think I think that 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 might be a way to do it as well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because sometimes we have to remember abuse of power is not always just what men in power do and that abuse of power can be sexually for women too okay any thoughts yeah I know the- I know that's a that's a hard one but I I. I think we need to. I think I think we need to recognize that guys aren't always the bad guys in this, and this is a perfect place to recognize. Yeah, David really was a bad guy here, but this isn't just about what men do to women. This is about what people with power do to people that they think they have power over. That leads me to doxology. Yes, please. Thank you. Fix this. <laughs> Matt no, is I'm like, I am so it. not getting in that conversation. No, I'm not. I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just trying to get Ephesians in here, and um, and it and my dear colleague Scott Schaff, who from Emory, is our commentator on this, and he says this. Uh, you know, this coming to the end of the first section of Ephesians is a magnificent doxology. <laughs> so once again, uh, you know, I'm going to a kind of uh, doxological uh, use of Ephesians, I, but it, you know, ob- obviously there's plenty of here on which to preach as well. Uh, but I'm, you know, the fact that the that this, you know, this section is the conclusion of the first half, and you get such, uh, you get this uh, praise language is um, is to wonder then where might this be where where might this be used in the worship service and if you remember a couple of weeks ago when Matt said you know um, this continuation of the lineage of David when we were talking about Michael um, there's also this clarity in terms of who are the people of God that this partic- particular passage from Ephesians turns us back to I am not turning to the king I'm turning to the King of Kings. It's such a beautiful prayer. And it's a nice reminder that one of the things the Bible does is teaches us how to pray. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, people think the Bible is this theological source book that you just have to learn how to uncode, or this Bible is something that's going to make you always feel happy. And uh, But here's a reminder that that the, the Bible gives us language for worship. Mm-hmm. And just to talk a bit about that, like what does it mean to use the Bible or to turn to the Bible for those kinds of of, of things. Um, 
you know, it's got a, an odd beginning for this reason that, I mean, you have to kind of say what, what's he I mean, any attentive reader will be wondering where are we dropping in? I think that's all of chapter one and two in the first half of chapter three, but, um, but yeah, this idea of how do you pray for somebody else? How do you pray for a congregation? So many people are terrified that in a church setting, they'll be asked to pray either to offer grace or to pray for mm -hmm. at the start of a meeting or something like, you know, where do you get the language for that? And, mm -hmm. and for most of us, our language is borrowed <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, from people who have gone before us from other prayers. And so just to kind of spend some time really reveling in that, this would be a good text to use liturgically. I don't know if anybody's thought of doing that with Ephesians or not, but that's a great idea, Matt. Yeah. Where did that come from? How about this? Here's the easiest. But yeah, I I remember in seminary <laughs> where we would talk about this because we would be in you know when people found out you were going to seminary and you were any kind of situation they were like oh the seminarian can pray and and we would all be like okay there is no class at seminary on spontaneous prayer like <laughs> we didn't we haven't practiced. So, yes, rely on scripture and you are good to go. Well, you've got up for the psalm this week as well. So yep. there's yep. your grace. Here's your, yep. here's here's your, your benediction. Here's your prayer. Wesley, your had, Wesley had us be prepared to always preach, pray, or die. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.